Ladies and gentlemen, I believe we're ready to start. Can't believe we got all of you to get up this early. It's amazing. Well, ladies and gentlemen, clients and partners, banks and fintechs, Manigans, Ministry of Innovation. Welcome to the first FIN42 conference here in Harpa Reykjavik. This is where you'll find the answer to life, the universe, and the future of banking. My name is Brai Fjaltal. I'm Chief Marketing Officer at Meniga, and I'll be your host during today. We have a great day ahead of us. We're really humbled by the many fantastic speakers who've agreed to come here to talk to us today about fintech and the future of banking. Um, and we're also extremely happy to see how many of you made the trip to Iceland. We're represented today by people from more than 80 organizations from 20 countries. The theme of today is banking beyond banking. Now, why have we chosen this theme? Well, at Menika, we've been working with banks for almost 10 years now, helping banks develop uh, better value propositions and, uh, and user experiences in digital banking using personal data. And we find ourselves increasingly encouraging our clients to move beyond the boundaries of what we would normally characterize as banking. And we feel that right now is a good time to really take a step back, think out of the box, and redefine what does it mean to be a bank. And before we kick off today, I'm going to spend a few minutes qualifying why we think this is the case. And we start here, back in 1997, with what is without any shadow of a doubt, the most overused quote in the history of fintech. But it was in 1997 that Bill Gates predicted that technology would make banks obsolete, but in hindsight, probably somewhat of an overstatement. But what point, the point that this quote makes really well is that we've been talking about disruption and disintermediation in banking for two decades now. Banks are still here, arguably doing pretty much the same thing as in 1997. So why is now the time to make bold moves? What has really changed in these 20 years? Well, I would actually argue quite a lot has changed. And sometimes, you know, more than we as an industry give ourselves credit for. First thing to keep in mind is that disruption doesn't happen overnight. It tends to happen in increasingly big waves of change. And sometimes these initial signs are relatively innocent. If you think about Netflix, when Netflix was founded, incidentally also in 1997, it was founded as a mail-order business of DVDs. And Blockbusters, who was dominating this market in, in the US and in many European countries, took one look at that company and said, I don't see the business model. They're not making any money. They're not touching our earnings. 13 years later, they were bankrupt. And by that time, Netflix was a completely different company, different business model, different technology. So what's the lesson? The lesson is, when you see those early disruptors and you can't figure out how they're going to make money, you don't believe in the business model, don't ignore them. Second point on disruption. If history is anything to judge by, inaction is simply not an option. Incumbents have every opportunity to ride the waves of digital disruption. But in order to do so, you need to be bold. And sometimes you need to look past uh, short-term profits and look at the long-term gains. You need to take risk. And that's something that can be tricky in a risk-averse industry. But there are plenty of examples that have done well in the face of disruptions. Think about Adobe, think about Samsung, even think about IBM at the time when PCs were popularized. All these guys made bold moves and they paid off. One of my favorite examples is actually much closer to home, a company called Shipstead, Norwegian media giant. 10, 15 years ago, they were facing shrinking profit pools all over the place. They had eBay moving into Scandinavia wanting to take over and build up online classifieds. So what did they do? They took one of their most profitable products, classified, they put it online, and they made it available for free. And they said, look, we'll figure out how to make money out of this. We need to capture the market. Today, online classifieds represent 80% of their earnings, and they've taken that model, if they've branched out geographically, they're all over the world now. So what am I saying? Should you take your mortgages and make them available for free? Online? Interest-free? Probably not. But if you do, give me a call, though. What I am saying is fortune favors the bold, and fortune favors the followers, the fast followers. And it's kind of tempting to be a follower in this game, and that's okay. But if you're going to be a follower, you better be fast. 
final point on disruption is that the only sure winner in disruption is the customer. Digital disruption is literally, the essence of digital disruption is literally the transfer of value from industry players to customers. And that inevitably evolves the shrinking of traditional profit pools. So for you that means, if you're thinking about making a bold move, you better be sure that it's anchored in customer value, and you better be sure that it's unfolding or uncovering some new form of revenue. This incidentally also means that if you're a bank and your current strategy is getting all of your products online and into the mobile phone as fast as humanly possible, and then instructing your product teams to develop a user experience that facilitates cross-selling, you're almost certainly doing the wrong thing. At best, you'll end up as the biggest fish in a pond that's slowly running out of water. And that's not so good. So what do these waves of disruption look like in our industry? And what is the situation today? I think there are many ways to paint this picture. This is our version of it. So the first wave, unsurprisingly quite innocent. And you know the reaction, something like, look at those cute little fintechs. No revenue, no customers to speak of. Trying so hard, what do we do? We feed them, we house them, we create incubators, because it's the right thing to do. And this is more or less the situation up until 2006, with a few notable exceptions, like, of course, like PayPal and others. But what happens then? A little bit different situation. It's more like, whoa. OK, where did all these fintechs come from? They're a little bit like the gremlins, you know, after you gave them water and fed them after midnight. A little bit cute, a little bit scary, all over the place. And during this period, you know, they're getting a little bit bigger. You have more and more uh, unicorns popping up, like Stripe, like Klarna, like Aiden, TransferWise. And these guys are getting funded. I think it was in 2009 that global funding in fintech, that global funding in fintech surpassed $1 billion for the first time. Now it's close to 30. So things are changing here, but nevertheless, these guys are just addressing underserved segments like SME lending that we're not interested in anyways. You know, they're, they're going after shrinking profit pools like payments. They're not touching our earnings. And besides, we have fantastic barriers to entry. These guys need to build core banking systems. They need banking licenses. They have to face the regulator, right? Wrong. Third wave. Whoop. This is now. By now, Monzo have built their own banking platform from scratch. We have a whole host of challenger banks with banking licenses. And most importantly, we kind of figured out you don't really need a banking license to disrupt banking. Also, we find ourselves in the networked economy where industry barriers are being broken down. We have everybody getting into everybody else's business in search for value for their customers. We have guys like Amazon getting into banking. We have telcos becoming media and entertainment companies. We have social media getting into pretty much everything. And it's not those, just those big guys. We have, we have uh, you know, Starbucks in the US is one of the leading mobile payment providers. Everybody wants to get into this business. So the competitive landscape is, is, uh, is changing. And when these big guys, they flex their muscles, we really feel the power of consumer scale. When Amazon says, we want to have a branded current account, and we want you to white label it, you better get in a single file in front of their headquarters with your best commercial offer. So as if all of this wasn't enough, now the regulator is siding with the disruptors. We have open banking regulations popping up all over the world, most notably in Europe and in the UK, where the regulator is ahead of the rest. So a lot is changing. And you, you forgive yourself for asking yourself, well, if this is the third wave and there's a fourth wave, what's that going to look like? But a fair question when you look at this is also to say, are these guys having any impact yet? And I don't have the entire answer to the questions, but there are some early signs. If you look at the UK, more than 60% of banks and payment institutions in the UK that are operational today were founded after 2005. And they account for 14% of the revenue pool. And this number is growing. And, and incidentally, this is double, like 14% is double the average in the rest of Europe. So if you're sitting somewhere there and wondering what the world is going to look like in five years, that's probably something like this. We have more than 40 challenger banks operational in the UK, and some of these guys are adding customers at immense rates. Monzo and Revolut have more than a million customers in the UK alone. And 26 have more than a million customers all over Europe. Now, I, we have Simon here from Monzo, so I'm not going to say too much about Monzo, but I will say this. 
we should be impressed by their progress. We should be inspired by their uh, strategy of, of building a financial marketplace anchored around the current account. And we should be inspired by the way that they engage their customers. You know, look at how they engage their customers in their strategy and their product development. If you read their blog or go to their community site, it's really interesting because the, the kind of loyalty they built with their customer, it's almost cult-like. And when you do that, adding new customers is a lot more affordable than when you don't have that kind of loyalty. Another interesting player to look at is Revolut. I mean, Revolut are adding around 7,000 customers every day. They were at Money 2020 this summer. They had 2 million customers. Now they're closing in on 3 million. They're adding almost a product per quarter to their portfolio. It's not like this is without growing pains. You see these, you see, if you're an avid user of Revolut, you see it in the app, it's getting more and more complex. But these guys are doing a lot right. And it's really hard not to be impressed by a company that was literally three guys in an office next to Monika and Canary Wharf four or five years ago. Final point here, we've been looking east now for a while at platforms like WeChat and Alipay with hundreds of millions of customers. And we've been wondering, when are they, is Facebook going to do the same thing? Whereas what we should perhaps have been wondering is, when are these guys going to show up on our turf? Because as Chris Skinner says is in, in his latest book, you cannot travel from Beijing to Lapland, go on a vacation and pay for pretty much anything with Alipay. And thanks to Danielle, who's speaking in the afternoon, you can now extend that itinerary to Iceland. At the same time, you can't travel from Copenhagen to Malmö, 50 kilometers, and pay for that trip with a single mobile app. And that's in spite of the fact that the Nordic banks are better than most when it comes to collaborating. So these guys are showing up on our turf, now serving Chinese tourists. But what's next? If you want the answer, I suggest you corner Chris or Danielle in one of the breaks and demand an answer. Um, but so maybe we are getting it, right? You know, banks need to adapt and change, and perhaps they are. Banks are collaborating more with fintechs. They're doing more agile innovation. They're investing in fintechs. In fact, we have three banks now invested in Minica, and they're all present here today. We have Unicredit, we have Swedbank, and our latest investor, I think it was announced early this morning, is, is Islands Banki, uh, added to the, to the tally. So welcome to Islands Banki. Um, but I was kind of impressed this summer when Ralph Hamers, the CEO of ING, opened up Money 2020 on this sentence. The only way for banks to differentiate today is via user experience. But then I started thinking, he's just saying the words, right? It's easy to talk the talk. Are they really doing anything? You know, launching Yolt in UK is not changing the world. So what, what's, why am I so impressed? Sometimes it's the body language or the way people say things. But then it dawned upon me. He's wearing sneakers. Now, he didn't get the last memo, because uh, he's wearing Puma, because everybody knows fintechs wear Adidas, but, <laughs> but, but you have to, but when you put those things together, right? The CEO of one of the biggest, well, most reputable banks in the world, on the biggest stage in the world, wearing sneakers, saying there's nothing more important in banking than digital user experience. Now, but seriously, banks are starting to change, and they're starting to take actions. There are many stories in this room, some of which will be told on stage today, and I'm looking forward to, to hearing them. Uh, but before, before we continue, I just want to state that, incidentally, I don't entirely agree with Ralph here. I mean, at Minica, we're definitely sure that user experience is, is extremely important to the future of digital banking, and it is probably one of the best differentiators today. But there are more ways to differentiate in banking. It's just that none of them have very much to do with the traditional way of doing banking. And that's really why this is such an interesting business to be in, and why it's so important for us to start thinking about banking beyond banking. So in summary, should banks be worried about the likes of Monzo, Revolut, and Alipay? Probably. But more importantly, they should be inspired by the things they're getting right. And they should be inspired by the likes of Facebook, Amazon, um, and financial that are breaking down industry borders, continuously reinventing themselves and their business model. And then they should do the same. We should be asking ourselves questions like, you know, can banks become a disruptive force in digital advertising? Can banks use transaction data to, to develop a groundbreaking market intelligence tool for their corporate customers? These are the type of questions we should be asking ourselves. And those, incidentally, are already two things that Maniga can help banks move beyond banking with. So it's time to let the real experts on stage to contradict everything I just said. But first, a few words on logistics. We have a tight schedule. We have two breaks on each side of, uh, of lunch, two half an hour coffee breaks, and then we have an hour for lunch. 
We'll be taking questions throughout the day using Slido, so you can ask the presenters questions while they're talking. They will appear on the screen here, and they can take the questions at the end. These are the instructions to start asking questions. And to get your juices flowing, I thought I'd ask everyone to pick up their phone, if you can, follow the instructions, open up a browser, go to slido.com and enter fin42. And once you're there, please open up the first survey. And I'm going to ask all the bankers here to answer the first poll. Are you ready? Mm. OK, good. First question, what company outside of the traditional banking sector, as a banker, do you currently fear the most? In other words, what company, fintech, technology giant, social media, is most likely to impact your competitive position in, say, the next five to 10 years? Is it Monzo? Is it Revolut? Is it Alipay? Is it Amazon? Oh, there you go. We're starting to get the answer here. It's Amazon. Amazon is winning. M Menica? Who's scared of Menica? We're here to help. Oh, it's definitely Amazon, Facebook, Google, Alipay. Do we have a winner? Come on, let's get the votes. There we go, there we go. And financial. Keep them coming. That's interesting. Where's Monzo? Vote for Monzo. Aren't you scared of Monzo? Not enough people from the UK. OK. Iceland there. <laughs> Liverpool. OK, stop it. <laughs> All right, second poll, second poll. Now, this is for the fintechs or the non-banks in the room. Which incumbent bank do you think is most likely to reinvent itself and emerge as a winner in the next five to 10 years? What banks are getting it right? Ah, it's, it's the sneakers. Barclays, interesting. There we go. OK, some of the banks present here believe in themselves. That's good. <laughs> the Icelandic banks are really scoring. Very good. Interesting. Look at that. There we go. OK, now you know how to work the technology, so we can use it throughout the day. Uh, so it's time to kick off.